Hello, true believers. Sean Arama, Sean Geek Podcast. You can find me on Twitter at Sean Geek. You can find me on Instagram at Sean Geek Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Sean Geek Podcast. And always be sure to go to The Real Meet the Geeks on Facebook, Instagram, and all those places. Midweek update, what's going on? I hope you checked the previous episode on Monday. The one about the fall of Gwen Stefani. I know I've been kind of talking about this one for a bit. Get really impassioned in that episode. Um, the, the, the fall of No Doubt, or the failure of No Doubt to reconnect with its audience. The failure of the tour, of the reunion, all this stuff. Is one of those that really stuck in my craw talk about it at length, talk about the the misconception of the band, the misconception of Gwen Stefani herself, Um, and then also tie all that into the failure of Adam Levine to gain credibility in the music industry. Very fascinating stuff. It almost feels like a Sofa King podcast uh, breakdown of what happens to, to no doubt it's, it's kind of interesting so that was that um, this coming weekend very exciting another studio session what does the studio session mean it means we're not recording this on the road which was long been the template for this show um, with all the extraneous car sounds that you're hearing right now we don't have any of those um Yeah. So, in the studio, we go to my brother's place. You also know him as Fast Fret Fingers or Todd Geek. We go to his studio. We occasionally get a call in from Voices by Tracy. And then we also get the inestimable, is that the right word? Uh, Corey Taves from Meet the Geek's fame. Very good friend of myself. I miss the boy. I can't wait to see him on Sunday. I hope we can make it out. Um, so this Sunday, what are we doing for studio? Well, we are going to discuss favorite movie soundtracks. We're also going to discuss favorite cover songs. And also, least favorite cover songs. Or even cover songs, if you will. Um... I'm not a fan of covers, and I'm also immensely a huge fan of covers. So I'm really interested to see what the uh, the rest of the gang have to say about their choices. Uh, I've spent all week, well, about a week now, you know, kind of pouring through my, my music collection, trying to find my favorite soundtracks, the ones that inspire me. And in fact, the interesting thing is with soundtracks... Uh, I often use them as inspiration in my writing. This, my, this, my children, is called the segue. <laughs> I'm segueing into the next bit. But I often use soundtracks to uh, to get me going. Uh, when you're writing, if you've got too many vocals going on, too much singing, it distracts from the writing process. So there's the soundtracks that... Uh, just have you know some great songs on it, and then there's the soundtracks that are like the movie score soundtracks. Um, we're going to cover some of that stuff on Sunday. I'm kind of really, really excited. So, inside of that, what else do I want to talk about? Well, a couple things. This is going to be its own podcast, but I finally saw Spider Man Far From Home quick gloss over right now is that the movie is phenomenal. Potentially the best of any of the Spider-Man films. Uh, it is just that solid. It is that good. The uh, Even though I saw the, the, the twist coming a, a mile away, only because I am a comic nerd and I understand the villain in the film. Um... It came from a slightly different angle than what I expected, but nonetheless, it was, it was great. Um, uh, 
uh, they made Jake Gyllenhaal was great uh, in that role of Mysterio. If you, I don't know, he nailed it. It was perfect. Uh, people often forget he's one of the greatest actors of that generation. Uh, you know, people always talk about the people he's acted with as the great actors of their generation. His sister, for example, or uh, Heath Ledger, or I mean, he's worked with some great actors, but he always seems to get the second banana uh, award. But man, that guy's good. I mean, you know what? Uh, the Spider-Man franchise continues to create excellent villains, uh, and it's something that the the regular uh, side of Marvel Studios could take a lesson from. They have to learn on how to make great villains again. They had some good ones, but they need great ones. Anyway, um, yeah, so uh, still be surprised with that movie. It was kind of a uh, surprise date, which is great. Just love spending time with her. She's, you know, she's, uh, She's my best friend, so I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Time alone, away from the kids, you know, kind of, you know, reinvigorate ourselves, spending quality time together. And then uh, we're much better at, um, we're much better at being parents after we spend a little time away. It's like, uh, at the moment, Corey has just dinged me on, on the phone here. That's that little ding you heard. Not sure what's up, but I'll have to check it after I'm done driving. Anyway, uh, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, I had a, a few great writing sessions over the last few days. Uh, I've been working through a section of the book, and I just finished that section, um, and it was delving into one of the uh, one of the main characters, and uh, I, I wrote excessive amount of backstory for this character that was in the book, so I excised some of it out of the book, because it's it's too much of a, he's not the lead of the book, he's one of the leads, and to give him more time than the others just doesn't work out, so I trimmed four chapters down to three, or sorry, five chapters down to three, I, I kind of changed things a little bit, um, and as I was doing that, it really informed the next uh, section the editing that I'm doing, which uh, revolves around the, the villain of the piece, uh, and, uh, and what he's doing, and what I really realized, I'm really enjoying this guy, um, all the great villains and all the great pieces of, of fiction always have something to them that makes them interesting. Sometimes, in, in some cases, like the Dark Knight, um, what happens is the villain becomes more interesting than the hero. So, I, I want to be I want to be sure to keep that balance because the the main hero of the piece. Let's see. Let's try not to screw things up here. So, the main hero of the of the story, the the biggest hero of the story is not necessarily the, the lead of the story. So when I say hero, I'm using the term hero not as in the character, but as in he's a hero, and he's the greatest hero that you'll ever see or ever meet. Um, that's who the one character is. So his opposition in terms of good guy is enemy. Um, I wanted to make sure that he was developed in such a way to be interesting, to be a, a good counterpoint uh, to the, the hero. And I wanted him to be interesting enough, but appealing enough, too, because there's got to be something to him. Like, you know, the bad guys do dastardly things, true, but there's a motivation behind it. And I as I've been, you know, peeling the onions off of this character, this, this villain character, he's becoming less of a villain in my own mind, and I'm starting to sympathize with him. Um, I'm seeing a, a change in his stylistic ideals of how the world works and his role in it. And, um, I'm 
seeing an altruistic side to this villain that I didn't realize was there before. And I'm actually really, really excited about it. Um, as I was writing, like, the last two or three sessions, it was just like, jeez. I just, wow, as I'm driving here, there's a deer just running. Oh, my God. Several deer just running across the highway. Uh, one of the most ones got smacked, but luckily, the driver had enough wherewithal to actually slow down and let him cross. Good, good on you, buddy. Anyway, um, I'm just really liking uh, th this villain. And as, a, as a writing lesson, if you will, if that's what this is. Things to look for when you're creating your villain is I, initially when I approach this villain, it's like, well, this guy's just, he, he's a jerk. He, he's, he's pure evil. He's evil incarnate. He's, he's not a good guy. You know, and that's, that's how I approached it. I, I wanted someone who was evil. You wouldn't question that he was evil. He was a bad man doing bad things. And that was it. But what I realized when I finished the first draft of the book, when I finished writing it originally, you know, he was, he was a bad man and he needed to be stopped and he, you know, and I'm not going to say whether he gets stopped or not, but in the end, in, in the climax of the, of the book, the climax was kind of meh. The, the good guys did, you know, kind of what they needed to do. They did all the things they needed to do. And it was just kind of like, yeah, okay, on to the next chapter. Like, it didn't feel, there was nothing, it felt like the stakes were not very present. So what that made me want to do was go back. Who is the who is the bad guy? I don't think I ever clearly defined him in a in a very good way. Or actually, I defined him too well, in such that he was very one dimensional. So on this edit, which I think is the fifth edit, I'm I've gone back to define like what is this guy doing? What is his motivation? Why is he doing what he's doing? He's not just doing it. He's evil. He must be doing it for a reason. So then I peeled back the onion a little bit, and I found a chapter in there where uh, the villain had had an interaction uh, with not the hero, but the, you know the, the the big good guy of the piece. And I realized that in there lies that grain of truth of who this villain really is. And it's in that it's in that piece where the roles flip between the hero and the villain where the villain in a moment is has more good to him than like he has more good to him. It's actually he's better than the hero. In that one moment, and it's that one moment that defines the villain, and it's that one truth, the one good thing about the villain that he clings to and does everything in the book based upon that one moment of goodness. So it's there where the villain is appealing. And I kind of look at him and I'm like, well, I can understand why you're doing that. I can understand why you do that, and it makes total sense. And I can't fault you for doing that because what you're doing ultimately is I mean, the ends justify your means. I mean, not really. To, in the end, the the everything he's doing is going to ruin everything. But he's the end result that he's looking for. You, you can understand. It's, it's like that whole thing in the X-Men films um, that Ian McKellen was able to convey despite some, you know, some kind of shoddy dialogue. A great actor like Ian McKellen can read the phone book and, uh, and, and make you cry. But his appeal in those X-Men films was he's not 
really the villain. He has motivations for what he does that you can identify with, you can understand, um, and any rage he might potentially have. Yeah, he should be mad. He should be angry. And he should be looking for some sort of closure. So, the story arc of Magneto and the X-Men films is exactly the, the right way to do it. Um, so, I'm, I'm seeing the same thing with him. And one of the characters I introduced in my third draft, um, he, he's supposed to be a throwaway character, but as I wrote him, I'm like, this guy's great. Like, I really, really like this guy. He's awesome. Um, and he's completely under underutilized. So I've added, I've let him, oh my god, I hate drivers in Winnipeg. I really do. It's horrible. Um, anyway, um, what I was saying. Oh yeah, so I added him into another chapter. And it doesn't give him much, much more to do. But it makes you... It's enough to say, okay, this guy is just above being, you know, uh, a, a, you know, a tense string, tense string character. Um, and I, I really like what I did with him. But by adding that chapter in, the actual villain of the piece... It adds that extra level of humanity to him. It helps redefine his goal, his end goal in this book. It helps redefine it even better. And it actually course corrects him to doing what he's doing. It's actually the moment in the book that truly humanizes him where he relates to another character sees that character's inner uh, strength uh, and moral compass and goes, I've been looking at this wrong all along. I should listen to my friend here. He figured it out for me. There was just that moment of he's trying to unlock this secret and he doesn't you know he's been working on this secret for so long and he needs someone not unlike him, but not a villain. And he goes, Ah, he's getting, he gets that ah moment that actually provides the the catalyst for what he does in this book. So I don't know, very exciting. I it's funny how as a writer you can actually go into your book and fall in love with your book again and look forward to working on it and editing it. I thought editing was the not fun part, but uh, I'm really enjoying it at this point. Like, I'm over the moon with what's happening. Just really, really enjoying it. So, anyway, I'm going to tap out here. I am in. I want this to be 15 minutes. But we're closer to 20. So, anyway, I'm going to post this uh, today, being Wednesday, with a midweek update from Sean Arama on the Sean Geek Podcast. Again, Twitter, Sean Geek, Instagram, Facebook, Sean Geek Podcast, all one word. Go find us, go link, share, send me a message. You can do so on any of those social medias. Let me know what you think of the show, if you've got comments, or if you've got things you want to say, or stuff you want us to talk about. I'm always looking for topics. We have a topic list that we work through. Hit, hit us up with some topics, or know, some interesting things, or do what the dastardly uh, Sam Thompson did, send some incorrect headlines that we can talk about. Those were fun. Anyway, see you guys on the flip side.